I know it's been a while, guys. We've had technical issues, which are thankfully all resolved now. And we have a massive workstation right in front of us in order to make videos a lot faster, which is good because I plan to get three videos out in December. So welcome to Catherine Howard. I know this is the wife that everyone has been waiting for all this time. First, I'm going to do a little adjustment in how we format these videos. What we're going to do is instead of putting all the Patreon thank yous at the back, we're putting them at the front now because YouTube are unfortunately very picky about their watch time and how much your video is being watched. So videos that are more likely to be watched all the way to the end will be the videos that get recommended by the algorithm more often. And it's very annoying because a lot of YouTubers like to thank their patrons at the end of the video so it doesn't ruin the flow. But of course, some people, they don't have Patreon. They will skip to the next video as soon as the main bulk of the video is over. So now we are putting patrons at the beginning of the video so you'll be more likely to watch all the way to the end. Yes, you can support this channel by becoming a patron. It really does help out. These lovely people here have been helping support me while I've been making these videos. It has been a lifeline when you're just starting out and you're just starting to make videos and they're just starting to become popular. And ad revenue is very inconsistent for new YouTubers. So you can help support the channel by becoming a patron. There'll be a link in the description. So this is my big thank you to my VIP patrons who have put so much faith in me. And thank you so much, Anastasia Gracia, Alison Cuff and Larissa. Thank you guys so much. You're the best. For those of you looking forward to the next Catherine Howard video to come out after this, the rankings video that I know so many of my subscribers have been waiting for, the script is already available to read. Okay, let's go. Henry VIII, on top of his 5,000 calorie a day diet, truly ate his words when he called his fifth wife his rose without a thorn. Though she was niece to the Duke of Norfolk, like her cousin Anne, her parents weren't as affluent as the Boleyns. Instead of a well-educated, cunning lady who had seen much of the world of politics, Catherine Howard rose out of obscurity with little education. Henry discarded a diplomatic alliance for her and paraded her around the North as the perfect jewel of womanhood he perceived her to be. In less than two years, all would be lost thanks to a single letter. Another queen would be headless, among three other people, and the Howard's influence at court was extremely diminished from then on. In episode five of Six Wives on Screen, let's look at the short and tragic history of Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard is, again, a wife whose birth date is debated. All we know is that she was definitely still a teenager when she arrived at court in 1540. Her father, Edmund Howard, was the younger brother of Thomas, Duke of Norfolk, and calling him the black sheep of the family was an understatement. He had little to no inheritance compared with his two older brothers. He commanded the right wing of the vanguard at the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Many of his troops fled the battlefield at the sight of the Scottish army. He expected to have a noble death going down fighting, but he survived and was knighted by his father. He got himself into debt to the crown when he borrowed £100, about 70 k today, when he was part of the train taking Mary Tudor the Elder to France in 1514. He married into wealth soon after, to the widow Jocasta Culpepper, who already had five children. Jocasta and Edmund had six children of their own, three sons and three daughters. Catherine was the middle daughter, born somewhere between 1520 and 1525. Due to Edmund's incompetence, they lived on very little, despite being of the aristocracy. After Jocasta died, presumably from childbirth complications, it was even harder for Edmund to take care of his children. Catherine found herself at a young age with no mother, no stable father figure, and separated from her siblings as she was sent to live in the household of the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. 
her step-grandmother, who took in several young but aristocratic women who were either orphaned or separated from their husbands. Meanwhile, her father assumed a new role of Comptroller of Calais, the only place in mainland Europe that was still owned by the English. Being a Howard, Catherine was expected to marry well, even if she didn't have a dowry, and her education reflected that where she learned reading and writing and religious virtues, that she may stay humble and virtuous all her life. In the English court, ladies who could sing and play music were highly sought after, and the first music teacher Catherine received was a man named Henry Mannix. And this is where things get awkward. Catherine was aged somewhere between 11 and 16 when Mannix began tutoring her, and he was 23 at the least, or 36 at most. Yeah. During these lessons, Mannix took advantage of his position, where he would flatter her and pressure her into letting him touch her private parts. Catherine would resist, but he persisted. As the belief at the time was men couldn't control their passions, he could not be blamed for what he did to a lady. No matter how much she refused it, it would always be her fault, and she secretly wanted it all along. Eventually, she gave in so he would stop pestering her, but she denied any full-on sexual intercourse with him. Mannix vowed he would have Catherine's maidenhead, but he was dismissed from the Duchess's household after the two were caught kissing by the woman herself. This happened round about the same time that Anne Boleyn's downfall took place. Almost immediately after Mannix's dismissal, Catherine fell under the gaze of another predator. This was the Dowager Duchess's secretary, Francis Durham. The maiden's daughter was a misnomer, where the Duchess's key was frequently stolen, and the male servants came inside for midnight feasts and romps. There, Francis flirted with Catherine, gave her gifts, and began a sexual relationship with her. They called each other husband and wife, promising to marry in the future. However, when the Dowager Duchess found out, she boxed Durham's ears though they continued to meet in secret. In 1539, Catherine's father Edmund died. Catherine seemed destined to spend her life unfulfilled in the Dowager Duchess's household. There hadn't been a queen at court for a while now, and with no queen, women had no place there. But later that year, Catherine finally had her chance to go to court. Another queen was on her way across Europe to marry the king. and Henry VIII would first meet before Anna von Claver's arrival, as the English maids were selected for her household, but this wasn't where he selected her to be his next bride. For now, it was simply an honour for a Howard to be serving the Queen. Francis Durham didn't want her to leave, as there were many handsome young men, higher born than he, who would love to have a Howard girl on their arm. But Catherine had always longed to go to court, and would likely have served Anne Boleyn or Jane Seymour a lot earlier, had they lived. Regardless, Catherine was given new dresses and caps by her step-grandmother and sent to court before Anna von Claver's arrival. Anna was a kind and gentle mistress to her ladies, but being shy and new to the court meant she stayed in her apartments and her privy garden, so Catherine was unable to enjoy the dancing and splendour of the court when Henry's previous wives were present. In this time, Francis Derham left the Duchess's household and went to Ireland. In the few months of Anna von Claver's reign, Catherine seemed to have forgotten about Derham and instead allowed a gentleman at the King's Privy Chamber and her distant cousin, Thomas Culpepper, to court her now. Thomas Culpepper began his career as a page, and his adeptness in all branches of court life, from hunting to dancing to pleasing his master, the king, made him ascend in royal favour rather rapidly. It is believed that Henry himself had a great deal of affection for the boy, perhaps seeing him as a surrogate son. Being a gentleman of the privy chamber was a great honour. Culpepper grew arrogant as a result of his earned privilege. According to a Protestant exile, Richard Hills, Culpepper sexually assaulted the wife of a park keeper, then killed one of the men who came to arrest him for it, only to be pardoned by the king. It can be debated that Culpepper's older brother, also named Thomas, was the actual culprit, but Hills asserted that it was the younger, as he also referred to him as working for the king. Whether Catherine Howard knew this or not was unclear, but their courtship was soon ended when it became clear that Henry VIII was displeased with his fourth wife and was looking for a way to be rid of her. Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, with the help of the Dowager Duchess and the Bishop Stephen Gardiner, arranged for Catherine to be within eyeline of the King during dinners held at the Bishop's London residence. Catherine would be encouraged to speak kindly to him and flatter him, playing the innocent maiden. She was also told by them that if the king were to make an advance on her, she must refuse to sleep with him, claiming to be defending her maidenhead, just as Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour had done. When Henry decided he wanted her for his wife, he went straight to his ministers and said, I want an immediate divorce. Yes. Yeah. What? what? 
Carry on, executioner! Carry on! <laughs> In July 1540, Henry annulled his marriage to Anna von Claver and set her up with a comfortable pension and lands. Thomas Cromwell was arrested and attained for treason and heresy. Henry and Catherine Howard married secretly at Oatlands Palace on the 28th of July. On the same day, Thomas Cromwell was beheaded on Tower Hill. When his head was spiked, it was turned away from the direction of the palace, so Cromwell couldn't spy on the king during his wedding night. Not that he'd want to. <laughs> The first months of their marriage was at the same time as a long, hot, dry summer that lasted until the first week of October. Imagine a summer like that. No ice, no air conditioning, no swimming pools, no clean drinking water even, and as a noble you'd be wearing a fur underlayer to guard against fleas. The eventual rainfall must have been a blessed relief. When summers were this hot, it usually foreboded the inevitable arrival of the plague in densely populated areas, especially London. So Henry and Catherine spent their honeymoon away from the city on a summer progress where a lot of time would be spent hunting and dancing. Afterwards, Catherine would appoint the ladies of her household. Among them were a handful of ladies who had been with her during her time with the Dowager Duchess. Perhaps they had blackmailed their way into her inner circle, so gossip wouldn't spread about her behaviour before her marriage. Jane Boleyn, formerly Parker, became a lady of her privy chamber when one of Catherine's own family members had to be dismissed. Jane herself was independently wealthy and could have lived a comfortable life away from court, but perhaps she liked being free and single at court with a status as a widow. While she never held the title in her own right, she would always be referred to as Lady Rochford, as her late husband George Boleyn was the Viscount of Rochford. According to the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis, Catherine was an imperious and commanding queen. Meanwhile, Charles de Maliac, a French diplomat, claimed she was beautiful and graceful and sweet, while remarking that she seemed thoughtful, so perhaps being the centre of public attention all the time was quite overwhelming for her. When it came to Henry VIII's children, their collective reaction to their new stepmother was mixed. Prince Edward was almost three years Years old, and Catherine thought he was adorable, presenting him with a gift when they met. The Lady Elizabeth was six, going on seven. Being a child prodigy in languages, mathematics and logic, it's likely Catherine couldn't relate to her on the same level, but still gifted her with one of the many necklaces she was given when she became queen. And then there was the Lady Mary, aged 24, unmarried, devoutly religious, and with a flawless reputation. She was actually quite distressed to see Anna von Claver had been dropped by the king, and was probably having a really horrible sense of deja vu. After meeting the Queen, Mary was shocked to learn that two of her maids were to be dismissed. Eustace Chapuis looked into the matter for her. Apparently this was because Catherine felt that Mary did not give her the proper respect owed to her, and complained about this to the King, who shared her offence and gave the order to dismiss the maids. Whether this was all a misunderstanding or not is unclear, but Mary managed to clear the air, and the maids were returned. Henry had reduced her household before in 1533, and would do so again in 1541, so we're not sure how much Catherine was responsible for this decision. However, Catherine did have her gentler side. During Christmas of 1540, Anna von Claver came to court, and Anna showed no hard feelings to her successor, where the two even danced together. Among the many gifts that Henry piled upon Catherine, were two spaniels and a ruby ring. Catherine was fond of animals, but as a symbol of their friendship, Catherine gave the ring and the spaniels to Anna. In 1541, Catherine believed she was pregnant and eagerly told the king about it. This happiness did not last long, as either she miscarried or was never pregnant to begin with. Henry VIII's ulcerous leg pained him to the point where he had to withdraw from public appearances and stayed in his privy chamber, barring even Catherine from entering. Talk arose that maybe the king was beginning to tire of her and take back the Lady Anna, or he was entertaining a mistress. When Henry recovered, he told Catherine he was planning a royal progress in the north that summer, where they would visit the places where the Pilgrimage of Grace had originated in 1536, and ensure that the citizens who had risen in protest against him would be loyal and submissive from then on. Unlike the previous year, this summer was full of rain, which made the progress a lot longer than planned. The main stops were Lincoln, York and Pontefract. There were also plans to meet the King of Scots, James V, at York Minster to sign a treaty. King and court waited for weeks, but the Scots never came. 
During this time, at Pontefract Castle, Catherine once again crossed paths with Francis Derham, who had returned from Ireland and was seeking a place at court. He had a glowing reference from the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk and directly requested a place in Catherine's household. She didn't actually employ him as her secretary, only as a gentleman usher, but as her current secretary was ill, Derham took on the mantle. Either he blackmailed her into employing him, or she decided to give him the job so she could keep an eye on him and make sure he didn't talk. Nonetheless, Deerham couldn't keep his mouth shut. He boasted that he would marry the Queen when the King died, which was treason in and of itself for predicting the King's death, and was violent when drunk, which didn't garner a glowing reputation among the court. At one point he physically assaulted another usher named John Fell, who chastised him for remaining seated after a Queen's Council meeting had finished. This was likely the beginning of the end for Catherine Howard, Jane Boleyn, Francis Deerham and Thomas Culpepper. <laughs> Catherine Howard, Henry VIII and the court returned to London in October after a long and anticlimactic progress. On All Souls Day, Henry was ecstatic that Prince Edward had recently recovered from a fever and the summer progress at least demonstrated that the northerners were loyal to him. At Mass, held in the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace, he had a special thanks spoken for Queen Catherine as she had behaved most regally throughout the progress. Never has the phrase, famous last words, ever been more applicable. The next day, Henry went to the chapel again, as he was wont to attend Mass every day. In his pew, he found a letter waiting for him, written by Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Many letters would find their way into the King's pew in order to get his attention over certain matters. The contents confessed to Henry that Queen Catherine had engaged in dubious and immoral behaviour while living in the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's household. Cranmer had become aware of these events from John Lascelles, whose sister Mary knew Catherine from that time and had explained to her brother why he shouldn't look for a place in the Queen's household. Cranmer claimed he wasn't brave enough to bring this to Henry's attention face to face and could only do it in writing. Henry did not take the accusation seriously and was surprisingly calm as he summoned members of the Privy Council to investigate the matter. The saying goes that Catherine was practicing dance steps with her ladies in her apartments when she was told that she was arrested and would be confined to the same apartments. One by one, the women who had lived with Catherine during her time with the Dowager Duchess and Derham were taken away for questioning. Four days later, Francis Derham was arrested, with the affair between him and Catherine Howard backed up by testimony from others who were in the Duchess's household at the time. There was a concern as to whether their relationship had continued after she had married the King. He swore that he hadn't, adding that someone else had succeeded him in her affections. He named the man Thomas Culpepper. While the investigation was underway, Henry was planning to leave Hampton Court for Whitehall and leave Catherine behind. While it may be fictional, it is not impossible to believe that Catherine slipped past her guards when she heard that Henry was in the Chapel Royal and tried to reach him to beg for mercy. Whether he was there or not, the guards caught her and she was pulled back to her apartments kicking and screaming. Catherine Howard was held at Hampton Court and questioned for several more days before being moved to the isolated Sion Abbey. She had to leave her fine clothes and Queen's jewels behind, only allowed to take plain dresses and headdresses with no precious stones with her. Catherine claimed that there was no pre-contract between her and Francis Derham and asserted that her marriage to the King was valid and even claimed that her sexual encounters with Derham had been non-consensual. Admitting there was a pre-contract would annul her marriage with the King and possibly even save her life as she couldn't cheat on him if they hadn't truly been married. Still, Catherine denied it. When asked about being lovers with Thomas Culpepper, she also denied those accusations, claiming these were malicious rumours spread by Lady Rochford. One day, the King's men arrived at Sion to take Lady Rochford to Whitehall for the questioning. She never returned to Sion Abbey and was imprisoned in the Tower of London when testimonies of other ladies had claimed that she had guarded Catherine and Thomas Culpepper when they were meeting in private, which was considered treasonous. She had a nervous breakdown and was declared insane. Culpepper himself denied that he had slept with the Queen, but he slipped up when he said that he intended to do ill with the Queen, and she had intended to do the same. This would be what condemned them. Another piece of evidence that was used against Catherine and Culpepper was a letter found among his possessions that has been used for centuries as confirmation that they were having an affair behind the King's back. Master Culpepper, I heartily recommend me unto you, praying you to send me word how that you do, 
It was showed to me that you were sick. The witch thing troubled me very much till such time that I hear from you, praying you send me word how that you do. For I never long so much for a thing as I do to see you now and to speak with you. The which I trust shall be shortly now. That wish doth comfort me very much when I think of it. And when I think again that you shall depart from me again, it makes my heart die to think what fortune I have that I cannot always be in your company. It my trust is always in you, that you will be as you have promised me, and in that hope I trust upon still, praying that you will come when my Lady Rochford is here, for then I shall be best at leisure to be at your commandment, thanking you for that you have promised me, to be so good unto that poor fellow my man, which is one of the griefs that I do feel to depart from him, for then I do know one that I dare trust to send to you, and therefore I pray you take him to be with you, that I may sometimes hear from you one thing, I pray you to give me a horse for my man, for I have much ado to get one, and therefore I pray to send me one by him, and in doing so I am, as I said, a four, and thus I take my leave of you, trusting to see you shortly again, and I would you was with me now that you might see what pain I take in writing to you, yours as long as life endures, Catherine. One thing I had forgotten, and that is to instruct my man to tarry here with me, still, for he says whatsoever you bid him, he will do it. In the Tudor era, even thinking ill of the king could send you to your death. Under the Treason Act of 1534, Catherine, Derham and Culpepper were charged for attempting treason for maliciously wishing, willing or desiring by words or writing or by craft imagining harm to the king. Henry wasn't hurt physically, but his ego certainly was. He burst into tears in front of his council and became so angry that he called for a sword and swore he would kill Catherine himself. The council convinced him out of it, so he took his revenge in other ways. First he passed a bill in Parliament which would allow someone to be executed for treason, regardless of mental state, which sealed the fate of Lady Rochford. Secondly, he passed another law, that a queen consort who had failed to reveal her past relationships with men was guilty of treason, retroactively condemning Catherine. Yes, this sounds very hypocritical on Henry VIII's part. How could he have at least three historically confirmed mistresses while married and yet condemn two of his wives to death for allegedly doing the same thing when the only evidence was someone else's testimony? If you don't understand how Henry VIII can do such a thing, welcome to Tudor History 101. Say goodbye to your faith in unelected heads of state. Unlike Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard and those accused with her would not have a trial. They were attained by Parliament, where the accused wouldn't even be present to plead their case. On the 10th of December, Francis Durham and Thomas Culpepper were taken from the Tower of London, fastened face down on wooden hurdles, and dragged through the streets of London, which, I will remind you, were narrow, uneven, twisting, and covered in in shit. Meanwhile, the bloodthirsty mob who saw public executions as entertainment were jeering at them and pelting them with anything they could get their hands on. At Tyburn Tree, Thomas Culpepper was the first to die, being the higher born of the two. He had been sentenced to die the traitor's death, but the king had commuted it to beheading. It was still a direct insult towards his status, as gentlemen and nobles would face their deaths on Tower Hill. Even Cromwell, who had risen from nothing, died on Tower Hill. Tyburn was for the commoners. This was but a warmer pact for Francis Durham's execution, who would suffer every aspect of the traitor's death. For those of you who don't know what the traitor's death is, well, do you know how William Wallace died in Braveheart? It was gorier than that. It was sore meets Passion of the Christ levels gory. The condemned was dragged to the place of execution and there hanged by the neck either from a drop or by being hoisted. They would then be cut down alive and laid out on a table or bound to a ladder where the executioner would take a hot knife and cut open the victim's torso, then have their entrails pulled from their body and burned before them, then castrated and finally beheaded, wherein their bodies would be divided so they would be displayed as a warning to the citizens not to commit treason. You wouldn't be able to shout FREEDOM when that happened. You could only scream. Culpepper and Derham's heads were spiked on Tower Bridge and remained so for months, preserved by the cold air. Catherine Howard was escorted from Sion to the Tower of London on 10th of February. It is likely that she saw and recognised the heads of Culpepper and Derham as she entered the Tower. She was not given the queenly welcome of her cousin Anne and arrived via Traitor's Gate, but was still held in relative luxury compared with other prisoners of the Tower. 
She would only know of the day of her execution, the night before, by the chief constable of the tower. When the news came, she asked for the executioner's block to be brought to her, that she may practice lying her head on it. On the cold morning of 13th of February, 1542, Catherine Howard was taken from her lodgings to Tower Green, where a scaffold was waiting. She had to be helped up the steps, being so nervous. She was unable to deliver a speech on the same level of dignity and calmness as Anne Boleyn, and could only see a few words, admitting that she deserved a hundred deaths for her trespasses against the king. She knelt before the block and was blindfolded, and she was fortunate to have her head come off in a single blow. After the blood had been soaked up by the straw and sawdust, and Catherine's body removed for burial, another execution took place. Lady Jane Rochford came to the scaffold just like her late husband and sister-in-law. She managed to keep her composure, and was decapitated with one stroke of the axe. The two of them were buried in the chapel St. Peter at Vincula. In the 19th century, their graves were reopened alongside Anne Boleyn's, when Queen Victoria's renovations were underway. They now have a burial slab on the altar of the chapel.